Meantime, I go and see somebody else in one of my advice bureau, and they're pensioners. Can they get a decent rate of interest on their savings? No. This is mad. We've got people who want their money to be employed for productive purposes, who can't get any reward for that, at the same time that productive entrepreneurs can't borrow money. This is a fundamental failing of banking. We know that the capitalist system requires good financial institutions, and we just fundamentally don't have them at the moment. So this crisis that we're in, it was manufactured by credit expansion in excess of real savings. That was driven by government institutions, and it was underwritten by taxpayers using coercive force. This is not a crisis of capitalism, it's a crisis of the state. So, let's talk about some political reality. <laughs> Why the government hasn't fixed this, and this was the uh, really what we, what we came for. First of all, I'd like to mention this on politi politicians and economists. This is a point Hayek made in 1978. He made this point in a book called The Denationalization of Money. By the 70s, he had given up on the state's ability to provide good money. And I do rec recommend the book The Denationalization of Money. It's an excellent read. It's considered madness by some statist economists, or at least statists in money. But it's a very good book, and he made this point, that the economic scientists should not be concerned with present political necessities, but making things politically possible. So the point, the reason I show you this is there's a difference between what economists can bring forward, and what politicians can do. As you know, I'm not an economist. I'm a politician now, and I'm an engineer from beforehand. I'm trying to straddle that gap. Funnily enough, that's not an odd thing for me to do. As an engineer, I've always straddled the gap between ideas and practice. As a chartered aerospace engineer, people would not have thanked me for working on engines without thinking about the ideas about how engines work. So it's not unusual for an engineer to think about ideas. I'd like to explore with you <coughs> some issues around these three major questions to do with the government. First and foremost, who understands this issue, this entire issue of money and bank credit and economic cycles? The answer is almost no one. In the House of Commons, myself and Douglas Carswell, in the House of Lords, um, the Earl of Caithness, almost nobody understands it. There are many people in the House of Commons who understand banking, they understand the work that they did during their careers, and very often they're highly competent, and they understand it extremely well, and they've been senior people in the city, and they really get it, and they've been hugely successful in investing in pension funds, foreign exchange, and so on and so on. But of course, people do degrees perhaps in other subjects, or they do degrees in contemporary mainstream e economics where this stuff isn't explained, or classics or whatever, they then get on the job training and then they make a lot of money, perhaps trading derivatives or whatever, and they never actually revisit the fundamental questions of what is money, what happens when you expand credit in excess of real savings, and so on and so on and so on. So I'm afraid the truth is that not very many politicians understand money and bank credit. And it's very much, we're very much in agreement, Simon and I, on this point. And where people do understand it, there's also the flat earth point. I think you made it earlier, Ben. Was it you? It was Simon, a big fan of Simon's my new, my new favourite. I've seen it myself. I sat down with a guy who's been traded, a sportsman, amazing, brilliant, brilliant guy. A guy called Gordon Kerr. You can find his articles on Cobden Centre's site. Trading derivatives, financial structuring for 30 years, almost invented, perhaps invented some of these products. And I said to him, Gordon, the earth isn't flat, it's round, and explained to him fractional reserve banking. And he said, Steve, F off. Don't so silly. Yeah? And that was the end of the conversation. And oh, okay, fine, left it. Got into the conversation with somebody else, and he happened to witness some of it, and he thought about it, and eventually came back to me and said, Steve, you know you said the earth is round? I can't remember what he actually said. He said, you know you said the earth is round? I said, yeah. He said, what about this, that, and the other? I said, this, that, whatever it was. And he went, the earth is round. <laughs> and you see it in people. They realise that the earth is not flat, it is round, and that fractional reserve lending, unrestrained by things like personal liability amongst bankers, with the, all, the, all the acceleration given to the process by the central banks, that is what enables the madness that's going on in our financial system. So Gordon is now a fantastic evangelist for fundamental bank reform, and I do recommend his articles. So, that's the first point, who understands the issue. Let's then talk about what politicians do. 
The first thing is, <clears throat> I believe genuinely that politicians get into politics because they care about other people in society. Whatever has been said to criticise politicians, I believe this remains true. Um, I'm not looking for sympathy. The fact is the job's difficult, extremely time-consuming. I've been very busy in international, professional jobs. Nothing prepares you for the level of work you need to do as an MP. And I've heard that time and again from new intake people. I'm talking McKinsey consultants, people who know what it is to be extremely busy. It's busy. It's hard work. You're exposed all the time. I'm standing here on camera. I know if I do something wrong, it will be all over the place. It might be all over the place anyway, because after all, I am saying, I am saying let's fundamentally change banking. So we're under a huge amount of scrutiny. You can't make any silly mistakes. It's actually quite a hard job. You wouldn't go into it unless you cared about society and other people. There may be some headbangers who just want to be a minister and don't care. I don't know. I can't tell you I've met any. I don't seem to have met any. I think they're all sincere, thoughtful people um, to varying degrees, but they all want to uh, make society better. But what is it fundamentally that politicians do? What we do is we get elected, because you cannot do anything unless you get elected. Now, if you read an essay like Bastiat's The State from the 19th century, we have been wrestling with the same problem for a very long time. That people like to pretend that the state only has one hand that gives, a benevolent hand that makes your life better, by coming along and saying, here's free education, and here's a pension promise, and here, and so on. And it, we like to pretend that it hasn't got the other hand, the nasty hand that dips in your pocket and takes the wealth that you earn, the hand that goes out and borrows from somebody else at the, at the promise of taxing from you later, the hand that in, establishes institutions that debase the money supply at the expense of all those savers. And we've been pretending this for a long time. And of course we don't get elected by, say, by saying, vote for me and I'll take all your money and give it to somebody else. Because you wouldn't get the vote, would you? And we know this, it's so simple, it's public choice theory and there's an enormous amount been written about it. But this is how the state comes to be so large. Once you start pretending that if only, oh, if only you could get the right people in charge of the state, everything would be all right. I'm sorry, it won't be, because the state can't deliver what people are asking it to deliver. And in trying to get the state to, uh, in trying to get the state to deliver the things we've asked of it, we've ended up getting into this mess of debt, this mess of currency debasement, all of the consequences for our economy and for people's sort of uh, financial awareness and morality in that respect. And it's, I'm afraid, led us to where we are. And why did, why did, I don't like to use the G word, but why did money come off gold ultimately? Why did Bretton Woods break down? It was because they couldn't, Nixon couldn't pay for the Vietnam War. That was leading to a run on the dollar and a run on gold, and so he came off the gold standard. And I'm afraid this is the state. It's the welfare warfare state. It funds itself by robbing you, and I'm afraid you should reject it for the most part. So that's what politicians do. Who are they? Well, they're good people and they mean well. Let's talk about some of the interests at stake. Constituents. My job is to look after my constituents. People who need to just get on and live their lives and have a good and productive and flourishing life for themselves, their children, perhaps some older dependents, some people that they care for. They don't need all this hassle. They don't need all this scary stuff about the banking system. They just need good money that they can save and earn and get by with. And I talk about this stuff, and as you've just seen quite boldly, because I'm afraid that state-provided money and the state-provided legally privileged banking system is failing my constituents. I do, I'm glad to say, have two median followers of Ludwig von Mises, <laughs> two median constituents, which is great, but I've only got two. <laughs> so um, we do have to spread some of these ideas and explain to people what is happening, why the banking system's failed them, why it is the state is running out of money, why it is that their life is becoming worse because the state is now, for example, closing day state centres that gave them respite from their child's special needs. It is desperately sad out there. Thousands of people are not now getting the services which they have come to rely on. And it is tragic. And it is a consequence of this banking system. So my interest is serving my constituents and doing it honourable, honourably. Lobbyists then. There are enormous ranges of interest groups and lobbyists. There are people lobbying for what amount, and I'm afraid, to special privileges right across the board. People want particular advantages for their industry. You may recall what Tim said this morning about from Adam Smith. I can't quote it as he did, 
but rare is the day that people come together in any profession, even for merriment, without starting to conspire against the public interest. The state's so big and dispenses so much money that it doesn't matter who you are, it's in, in your interest to lobby the state. So everybody's doing it. Trade bodies, uh, charities are all getting together to try and persuade MPs and others to lobby on their behalf for more money out of everybody else's pocket. And there's then this huge set of conflicts of interest about who's getting what, whose money by force. That does include, of course, uh, financial sector and banking interests. Um, officials are an important lobby group. You look at any government department, it will have a, a handful of ministers, and it will have hundreds or thousands of officials. And it is in their interest to be paid more. And they get paid more if they spend more, and if they have more staff. And then we wonder why the state grows so large. So officials are a very, very important lobbying group. So why has this not changed? People don't understand it. People want the state to be benevolent and help them in their lives, and that is not necessarily an un unreasonable request. It just it turns out the state is incapable of doing it. But politicians have been all too ready to say to people, vote for me and I'll give you free stuff. And then there's a whole range of... Um, interest groups who then come into this picture to try and persuade the state to go one way or another. As I say, I do recommend Bastiat's The State because it's a pretty, it's probably the most eloquent description of this phenomenon and it was written in the mid-19th century. So that's why it hasn't happened. Let's talk about strategy then and try and get somewhere a bit more upbeat. Let's talk about the problems of reform. Reformers quite often, very quickly, agree on political and practical solutions. The Austrian School of Economics, I will talk for a moment about the Austrian School. The Austrian School is split between those who take a philosophical approach and about property rights and say either you deliver a thousand pounds to me for safekeeping and immediate use, in which case it's your property and I'm fulfilling a custodian role, or you say to me, here's a thousand pounds, lend it to somebody else for a return. And you lose control of that property, you've loaned it to me, I loan it to somebody else, they invest it, they pay back the principal together with the interest, I then give it back to you and take my cut. And the property rights are clear, but that money you deposited with me for safekeeping is still mine. And I don't say, we know this, I'm just recapping it, because what, what, they're, what they're doing is that the Austrians of this school are saying it's just a fraud to say, oh, you can have that £1,000 any time, back any time, or oh, really, any time, I really mean it. I really mean it. Here you go, this is 950 quid. It's just, in those terms, it's just a fraud. However, about half the Austrian School of Economics take a utilitarian perspective on this and tend to argue that if only you took away from the banks all of their legal privileges and treated them like any other business, the extent of fractional reserve lending would be so small because of the threat of runs and personal liability and so on that actually the utility function of fractional reserve lending means we should allow it. And actually there is an argument that if people wish to enter into that contract freely, knowing what they're doing, and take that risk, there's an argument that they should be allowed to. And therefore there is a Judean people's front style split in the Austrian School of Economics. I have to say I tend to take the philosophical approach to this myself and be a 100% reserver. But I try to rise above the debate, because I'm not a professional economist, I'm a politician, I've got the biggest megaphone in the UK, and I'm using it to try and widen this debate. But I'm trying to rise a little bit above the debate so that other people can help us. Abolishing the Bank of England is quite often floated as something which ought to happen. Funnily enough, I don't think Mervyn King has floated that yet. Uh, but people do do it. Ron Paul in the United States, End the Fed is one of his books. So people do, 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 do float it. I've talked about the 100% uh, reserve thing. For me, the mainstream debate is pitiful. Um, the mainstream Keynesian monetarist consensus is around keeping a central bank. The current framework tends to be seen to fulfil uh, humanity's needs uh, according to the current mainstream. And for me, that's a bit pitiful because it isn't working. And as Ben has very neatly demonstrated earlier, the trajectory it's placed us on is obviously unsustainable.